for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom. Right, Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Saturday evening, May the 24th, 1980. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Memorial Weekend Deliverance Seminar. Wynn Worley is the teacher of the evening. Should this tape for any reason be defective, please explain and return for replacement. This is tape one of two tapes of Saturday evening service. Hello. All the people said. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Everywhere deliverance is breaking out. Everywhere the power of God is exploding in marvelous, marvelous blessing for the people of God. Uh, everywhere God is raising up an army. He's raising up that army. He's got an army and it's marching through the land. The trumpet call is sounded and the soldiers are listening. They don't know all about what the orders are. They're just, they're kind of, I heard a trumpet, I heard something. <laughs> and uh, you wouldn't believe how many people call and write and walk up to me in the meetings across the country. Uh, we just invaded Oregon last uh, a couple of weeks ago. Going to Seattle soon. And uh, you wouldn't believe how many people walk up to me and say, I picked up battling the host of hell. Thank God. We thought we were crazy. <laughs> because the Lord showed us some of these things and we began to try to share them and people put us down. Our preacher cussed us out and told us we were crazy and off into heresy and where in the world did we get such things? And said, here you've laid out the whole thing and more. Just what God was telling us. Isn't that great? That's a confirmation, you see, that God is saying the same thing. That just some folks haven't tuned his channel yet. Did you know that God is not broadcasting but one message in this dreadful hour, this hour in which we're hanging over the cliff, and we're just rocking about to give way and the whole thing to go over the top side? We're not going to crash, people. We're already in the process. It's that bad. And God is broadcasting emergency deliverance, emergency, emergency, emergency. So some people are throwing a Sunday school party. Others are having a picnic to try to beat the devil off. Some are even calling a little prayer meeting to say, now lay me down to sleep, help me get up in the morning and eat, amen. <laughs> that's about the depth of the praying that's going on. It's pitiful. I bring you reports from across the nation, but thank God there's a little handful that is rousing. And the demon is screaming at me and cursing me and my church and everybody that believed like I do about deliverance and threatening all kinds of dreadful things. And he said, Worley, he said, we've got to get you stopped. And then we can destroy that dumb church of yours and then we'll go to work on the rest of those idiots. He said, you're just, uh, you're just causing a lot of trouble. You're making waves. <laughs> and I said, well, if you, uh, I said, if you get me, I said, what are you going to do with the books and tapes? They're going out all over. He said, oh, shut up. We'll get them somehow or another. I said, well, what are you so worried about? It's just a few thousand books, just a few thousand tapes, that's all. And there's just a few hundred people scattered here, there, and yonder. He looked at me and he said, Worley, you know it doesn't take many. I said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I'll tell you who my hero is, Elijah. One man tipped over the whole religious apple cart in one afternoon because he believed God when everybody else had forgotten the promises of God. And every time I get discouraged and I feel like a man armed with a toothpick with orders to attack and pulverize that granite mountain, that's the churches and the preachers. You don't think it's like that. You ought to take your toothpick and go pick a while. But every time I get the feeling that way, God reminds me it only took one Elijah to destroy the whole religious kingdom Jezebel and her priests had worked for years to build up and consolidate. And in a few hours' time, the nation was on its face crying out, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. They didn't say Elijah is great. They said, The Lord, He is God. They lost sight of Elijah and the blinding flash of power they caught sight of God. And friend, they'll lose sight of you and me if we're in the battle. But they'll get caught in the blinding flash of his Shekinah glory when it explodes. If you're in this trying to get a little glory, you know, get a little glory dust on you, just 
Dust on out. You're in the wrong frame. There are no stars in this business. There's only one star. He's the bright and morning star. That's Jesus. Everybody else is a worker. And if you want to be great, you work the hardest. You sleep the least. And you attack the enemy the most savage. That's, you, know, you want to be great? You sure? That's how you do it. Some of you just resigned. <laughs> Jesus said the greatest position of all is to be the servant. If you're ambitious, be ambitious to be a servant. To serve the needy body of Christ because the body is needy. Amen? All right. Tonight, <clears throat> we're going to go on a fishing expedition to see what we can find. <laughs> How many of you have never been in a mass deliverance service? Oh, dear. <laughs> well, this ought to be rather interesting. Well, buckle your seatbelt. It's going to be very quiet for a little while, and then things will probably change. <laughs> I want to think tonight about areas wherein Christians are being blocked from having God's death. You heard Marcus give us some wonderful encouragement to believe God and to reach out to God. And some people, in spite of all these blessed precious promises, have not been able to appropriate even the things they know about. Now there are two major areas that are blocking God's best blessings from you. And he slow, the devil will slow them down to a trickle if he doesn't manage to cut them off altogether. And you certainly don't want anything on those supply lines. Amen? The first area, of course, is the area of forgiveness. If you ask the average Christian, have you forgiven those who have hurt or disappointed you, the answer almost invariably is, well, of course. The answer should be no. There are many people that I'm still irritated with. That wouldn't sound too religious, but I mean it'd be more close, closer to the truth. The answer should be there are probably people that have heard or disappointed me from the time I was a child and I have forgot about the incident. And therefore the devil has covered his trail and has left in me a foothold whereby he can put demons in my life. Everybody gets hurt and disappointed in their life. If you've been hurt and disappointed, don't feel that you're all by yourself. Everybody has had the same experience. Some have perhaps been hurt more cruelly than others, but everybody has gone through this to a certain extent. Now, the hurt and disappointments are dealt to us by those who are closest to us. And we start with mom and dad, of course. But before I do that, maybe I should uh, make sure that you don't think I just made this up out of whole cloth. In Matthew 6 and in Luke 11, you will find what is called the Lord's Prayer, which is not the Lord's Prayer at all, for that's in the 17th chapter of John. But this is the model prayer, where Jesus answered his disciples' question when they said, Teach us to pray. And he gave them all the major elements of prayer in a very simple prayer that we pray uh, by rote and it doesn't mean a thing. There's a, there's a significant phrase in there that we have certainly overlooked, where it says, Forgive us our sins as or with the same measure that we forgive those who have sinned or trespassed against us. And of course, you know, when we feel nice, and when we're kind of religious, then we're willing to forgive those who have done us wrong. Especially if we're wrong, we kind of ask for it. But on the other hand, if it's, we're feeling kind of stinking, which is most of the time, They'll say, well, I'm not going to forgive them. No way. They had no business doing that. They had no business saying that. I'm not going to get away with it. I'm just not going to let them get away with it. So what happened? You've laid yourself open for the demons to work. Not right away, because it takes a while to get a landing field built. And believe you me, they'll come in. And if you've got a pattern of unforgiveness set up in your life, for people hurt you and hurt you again and again and again. Unless you forgive them, you are going to lay yourself open for spirits of unforgiveness. And unforgiveness doesn't like to be a lone ranger, so he always works to get his friends' resentment and bitterness to join him. 
When that simple terror gets inside, they immediately set up housekeeping and begin to prepare to wreck your life. Now this starts when you're a child, and so many times people are not even aware of what's going on for a good while. And then after they know what's going on, they don't know exactly what to do with it. You must forgive those who have hurt or disappointed you. It's not optional. It's an absolute essential. It must be done in Jesus' name, for if you don't, you're going to pay a dreadful penalty, far worse than the injury that you thought you have suffered or that you actually suffered at the hands of somebody else. Well, of course, the first reaction is, well, that's the you don't understand. These people don't deserve forgiveness. They are mean. Why should I forgive them? Because Jesus said so. He said, well, I don't know. By the way, talking about deserving, when you were born again, and most of the people probably in this room, if not all of them, have been born again, the day you were born again, you were the recipient of God's love, grace, and mercy. Isn't that true? Unbelievable mercy and grace came your way. Did you deserve it? Oh. Now, since the day that you did receive all this grace and mercy, day by day, the mercy and love and provision of the Lord has been abundantly showered upon you. Has there been a single day since you've known the Lord that you have deserved the blessing of the Lord that has come upon you? Then who are we talking about deserving what? You see, we've got it all messed up. When somebody owes us something, it's bad. When we owe the Lord something, it's different. Huh? Let's be consistent. You say, well, I'm still not going to do it. Well, I'll give you some motivation. If you don't, forgive. If you persist in rebelling against the plain teaching of the Word of God and just are hard-headed and stubborn, say, well, all right, I understand what you're talking about, but I'm just not going to forgive. I won't do it. Then you will sooner or later develop cancer and or arthritis. Now everybody's awake, because nobody wants that rotten mess to loose at your doorstep, right? You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about spirit. There's an evil spirit called cancer, several different varieties. I've talked to him. Anybody in deliverance has talked to cancer. Arthritis is a spirit. When the spirit leaves, the body takes care of the condition. The thing that prevents healing is the interference of evil spirits. Now, he said, wait just a minute. The best old Christian gentleman I ever knew, the finest Christian lady, the dearest saint of God I ever walked the face of God's earth. You mean to tell me they had demons? Well, you certainly don't think God put that mess on them, do you? Hmm? That came from the enemy. But you know what? Why did God permit it? Because they had not been taught how to blow up the landing field. You see, unforgiveness, bitterness, and resentment prepare the way for the entrance of cancer and arthritis eventually. They also do other hurtful things, but those, those are two of the shockers. And the people who are dear saints of God, who are always doing for other people, give more of their time, their money, their effort, their interest to other people than ordinary Christians. Therefore, they get hurt more, don't they? They, hurt, they help ungrateful, mean, hateful, dreadful people who turn on them and viciously attack them and disappoint them, don't they? But because of the way they are, they say, oh, it's all right. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. But they don't know how to handle it, and they're hurt inside. And in that deep hurt begins to build up the stage for a disaster. Aren't you beginning to get a little bit angry with the devil? That's the kind of stunt he's pulling on us when he works through the Spirit to destroy even those who are seeking to walk with him. And one of my jobs is to get people mad at the devil so they quit fighting with one another and start fighting the real enemy. And the devil's got us fighting one another. We need to concentrate our firepower on him, on his forces. When that happens, you'll see the enemy crumple and the enemy lines break and they'll flee. Now, you must forgive. And we have made a mistake because we thought forgiveness was a matter of the emotions. We get all emotional about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not really a matter of the emotions at all. It's a matter of the will. 
You make up your mind, I'm going to do it. When you say, I won't do it, that means I will not. You will not do it, you will do it. And you must will to forgive. But I don't feel like it. Well, that's your emotions, you see. That doesn't got anything to do with it. You might feel like taking castor oil, but sometimes you have to, you know. Somebody might stick it down. You must will to do that which is right. Now, if you don't do this, there are hurtful consequences. You must forgive mom and dad. Oh, they never did anything to hurt this for me. Now, you didn't always feel that way. There were times when you thought they undoubtedly were the meanest humans that ever walked the face of God. They deliberate. They blocked everything nice that you wanted and wouldn't give you the things you wanted. Since you grew up and got a little sense, you found out that there were times they couldn't have done it, maybe. You found out you understand some things you didn't understand before. But there were times when you really didn't understand anything that was going on. And the hurt was done. Did you know that you can be hurt over something that's stupid and that's not real? Did you know you don't have to be rejected to feel rejected? You can be surrounded by love and acceptance to feel rejected. That's right. And you must forgive those who have hurt you. Your father and mother or those who reared you will be the first ones you need to forgive. Husbands and wives are good at hurting each other, disappointing each other. Ex-husbands and ex-wives are experts at it. <laughs> children hurt parents. Parents hurt children, close relatives, close friends. All of these people that we come in close contact with are the ones who deal us hurt or disappointment. And depending on the type of personality and nature you are, to that extent you will be hurt and wounded. One of the big blocks in deliverance is deep hurt, a spirit called deep hurt. And it usually comes about because of bitter disappointment. I was dealing with somebody last night, I don't even know who it was, who had bitter disappointment and deep hurt were holding back a lot of other things from coming out. When we got those out, it's kind of like pulling seven, uh, the bath to blood. The other one, we've got to deal with these things, people. By the way, people often ask me, what do you think about inner healing? I think it happens when you get delivered, and I don't think you have to wander down the pathways of time hand in hand with Jesus. And if you got Ruth Carter Staples book, you all throw it in the fire. That's a devilish thing. It's old psychotherapy, Freudian psychotherapy with a few Bible verses in it first. I don't think that, lo that lady knows the Lord from a lizard. You say, well, I don't agree with you. Well, now you know what I think, and you think different, but that's the way it is. If you listen to her give the plan of salvation sometime, you'll throw up. She can get the Buddhists, the Mohammedans, and everybody else in. Mm -hmm. Something wrong with her whole notion. You said, but she's a good woman. Well, depends on what you mean by good. Well, I'll let that rabbit go running through the bank, but I shot him good before he got away. I believe that inner healing takes place when you get delivered. We don't go into any special inner healing things. A lot of the things we do promote inner healing. And I'm, uh, but as far as having a separate inner healing thing, we don't. Now, the, um, you must forgive. It's not also. There's another person you must forgive that you have been hurt and disappointed about for a long time. That's yourself. Some people have forgiven everybody except themselves. And they're still mad at themselves because they failed, they floundered, they didn't do, they didn't live up to the standards they set for themselves, and they're mad at themselves. And you wouldn't believe the spiritual havoc this causes and how it prevents God from giving his best blessing. We're talking about God's best blessings. I didn't say you couldn't get any blessings. I said, the best. Don't you want the best? I mean, I'm so needy. I need the whole thing. You know, I, I don't... Uh, I don't need just bits and pieces. I can survive on those, but I'd whole lot rather have the whole bunch. I mean, you know, you can eat the neck of the chicken, but the breast is better. Hmm? How the drumstick, depending on what you like. Hmm? Oh, listen, people. You can will to forgive. It's such a blessing. Some of you who are carrying deep hurts tonight who have never been through this are going to be greatly helped in just a few minutes. This is one of the most blessed things about getting to share this message. I get to see Great loads lift off of people right in the congregation, and God works miracles. It's just such a blessing. And I look forward to one of these services because I know that release is going to come about in many lives, depending on the depth of their hurt. Some of you are going to realize a load lifted off of you that you didn't even know you were carrying, but you were just tired all the time. 
Others of you, in two or three days, you're going to become aware of. One man told me recently, he said, I heard you say that. And said, wow, sure enough, two or three days later it did. It dawned on me what had happened. I don't care whether it happens right now, in two or three days, as long as it happens. I want the people of God unloaded so they can move freely with the Lord. Amen? Now, if you, uh, while I've been talking, by the way, the names and incidents have been popping into your mind just like popcorn going off. Some people you haven't even thought of in a long, long time. That's the Holy Spirit. He's pushing them to the top. He's saying, good, let's get rid of this garbage. We're going to dump it overboard. And he's bringing them to your mind right now. People that you need to forgive. You won't have to struggle for them. You won't have to reach for them. They'll come. Just bang. They'll pop right into your mind. And that's the people you need to forget. Now, Mark and I have a terrible time about this. He's always keeping his crazy eyes open, and I won't let you do it. <laughs> but I have a real good reason. It's because people are nosy. You see, if, if I'm praying right here with my eyes open, and I'm concentrating especially on something as deeply personal as what we're going to be praying about here, and something happens over here, something moves over here, I just have to turn and see what that is. And by the time I turn and get to watching, I've lost track of what I'm praying about. The devil's distracted me. Now, I know you're not like that, but there's some of your neighbors that are. <laughs> and rather than to point them out and make them feel, you know, conspicuous, well, I'm going to have everybody bow their head and close their eyes just so they won't be embarrassed. You won't mind that, would you? Now, when we do this, some people may say, well, I'm not going to do it. You know something? I don't care. <laughs> I can look at you and just smile. It doesn't bother me. It's part of it. Now, what we're going to do is not going to hurt you. It could help you a great deal. I would encourage you to take part. I won't even be watching to see who's taking part, really, because it doesn't really matter. This is up to you. I can't make you forgive people. I'm not here to make you. I'm here to show you this is what Jesus wants. If you want to be obedient, then you just do what he says. That's all. I'm going to lead you in a form of prayer. It's very simple. Nothing complicated, nothing mysterious. But it will work, thank God. All of God's business is simple. Direct and to the point. Men make it complicated. God makes it simple. Let's bow our heads, those who want to take part in this priest. Repeat after me, Father in heaven. I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I confess to you. In the past, I have not loved, but have held unforgiveness and sometimes bitterness and resentment in my heart against certain people who have hurt or disappointed me. I now recognize this as sin, and I confess it as sin. For your word declare, if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I claim that forgiveness for myself in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for it. Now, Father, in obedience to what Jesus has said, I do now forgive the following people who have hurt or disappointed me. Now I want you to very quietly just put in the first name of the people that come to your mind that may have been involved where you were hurt or disappointed. Girlfriends, boyfriends, business partners. Father, bring these things to the people's minds, those who have caused spiritual blocks in their lives. I do now forgive these people, and if they are living, I ask you, Lord, to bless them. In the future, if you should remind me of others, who have hurt or disappointed me. I promise you, Father, 
and I shall quickly forgive them also. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. And there's nothing complicated about that. It's a matter of the will. I do now forgive. I didn't mention earlier. You might say, well, why should I ask the Lord to bless them? They're mean. Let me just explain for your clarification. If a person is lost, what's the best blessing can come to them? You're not so mad at them you don't want them to get saved, do you? That wouldn't be too religious, would it? We have to be careful, you know. If other people found out we weren't religious, they might not like hmm? You say, well, the one I'm thinking about is supposed to be saved. What about them? If a person names the name of Christ but is off the track, doing wrong things, saying wrong things, what's the best blessing God could give for them? Bring them back to himself. Are you so angry at them you don't want them to come back to the Lord? That wouldn't look too good on you either, would it? But see, that's why we must, we can freely ask them to forgive. Now, in the, we must understand that God has given the orders in this. All right? And if you remember others who need to be forgiven, by all means do that. And that's one of the blocks that keeps people from receiving God's best. Let's move on to some other areas that, in a sense, may be even more serious. All of these are serious areas, but the next one really packs the wallet. For example, if you've been to some of these meetings or if you've read the book, you may be aware that curses really can take their toll of believers. Are you aware of Deuteronomy 23.2? The bastard is cursed to the tenth generation from the congregation of the righteous. If you hadn't heard that before, that's kind of a jolter, isn't it? Jolts me every time I say it anyway. I get mad at the devil. Do you realize that that's what all this illegitimacy is about? Do you realize that's why the devil is promoting free love, free sex, and all this stuff? To get us loaded with illegitimate kids, unwanted children, who will have a curse riding on them to the tenth generation? You say, well, that's terrible. Every one of these curses that's riding on you will be a weight. Curses can be broken. Christians are the only ones who have the authority to do it. And how many know how? Very few. In the books on deliverance, the only ones that I'm aware of, unless there's some that's come out recently, the only books that mention curses at all and what to do with them are my books. This baffles me because the Lord showed us this early in the ministry. And he showed it to us because I should have known anything about it either. I was like you, you know. I got saved, all the curses were taken care of. Huh? Know what you thought? I did too. I was dealing with a young man who couldn't get the demon out of it. We battled with it and battled with it and battled with it. He came up and said, it's bothering me again. And I, I hit it again. I said, you're going to come out here tonight. He said, no, I'm not. He didn't sound like he was fooling. I said, if I have to stay here all night, I was real brave. I said, if I have to stay here all night, I'm going to get you out this time. I was mad. No, I'm not coming out. There's no way I can come out. I have a right to be here and I'm not going out. Well, we commenced the battle. About 15 minutes, I had him on the rope. I, was, I did play dirty. I used every nasty, dirty trick out of my considerable array of nasty things that the demons don't like. And I finally pinned him, and he was gasping and screaming and begging for mercy. Well, that was a nice thought. Because, you know, when a demon asks me for mercy, like I'm saying, mercy, Willie, mercy. I said, oh, you want mercy? Yes, you Christians are supposed to be merciful. I said, oh, well, I agree with you. We're supposed to be merciful. And the Bible says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. He'll be as merciful to you as you've been to her. <laughs> then they scream. Because <laughs> they've never showed mercy to anybody. Anyway, this thing said, Wait a minute, I can't come out. And he was heaving and heaving and heaving. I said, Yes, you can. You're just lying. You cut that out. You stop lying and come out of it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's talk. I said, I don't want to talk. You come out. He goes, Ugh. I can't, wait, wait, I can't. Well, 
He was heaving and heaving and nothing was coming out. The demon was crying out, wait, let's talk, let's talk. And I said, well, you better talk quick because I'm tired of moving with you. I said, you're in one of my sheep and that's a dangerous place to be. And I was a pastor on the warpath and I was after And he, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, just a minute, just a minute, work. I hold everything. You've beaten me. I'm tired of this old house anyway. There's no fun in here anymore. It's like you came to this stupid church. All he does is read that dumb Bible. Go around singing and praying in dumb, stupid tongues. And said he won't do nothing. But all he did is torment his mind and upset his dreams. Said he used to do everything he told him to. Said he won't do nothing now. Said you just ruined this dumb church. <laughs> I found that rather refreshing. And I said, well, you've got to come out of there. He said, I want to leave. But you've beaten me, and I'm tired of this. I don't want to be pounded anymore. He said, you've whipped me. He said, but I can't leave because I'm bound in by a curse. You break the curse, and I'll get out. And I thought, oh, Lord, don't let him find out I don't know how to break the curse. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. The demon is conceding his defeat, supposing he finds out the pastor doesn't even know how to break a curse. How embarrassing. Well, partly to, uh, out of curiosity, but mostly because I was stalling for time, I said, how'd you get in there? He said, well, a stupid girlfriend of his put a love potion on it. And I'm bound in. It was a lust spirit. But I'm bound in because of that love potion. I said, but he's renounced that. He said, I don't care. It's still here. I said, Lord, help. <laughs> And a still small voice, I screamed, Lord, help! You know, and you know, he always comes through. I opened my mouth and said, Jesus Christ died on the cross for Bobby, became a curse on the cross for him, and he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that were against him. I declare that curse null and void, broken and destroyed by the blood of Jesus. The demon said, Oh, it's melting, it's melting, it's going away. Come on, guys, we got to go. Ah! And that's how I found out about curses. And I don't know how many curses that those two verses have broken, but it's a big number. There may be other verses that are just as good. I'm not saying that's the only two. Those just work real well. So, you know, as long as I handle fiddle two, you just put it on that one and come along. But the curse of the bastard is a dreadful thing. Oh, by the way, it says to the tenth generation. What was happening on both sides of your family ten generations ago? Uh oh. You don't even know three or four generations ago, do you? Might be healthy, so after a bit we're going to break the curse of illegitimacy on ourselves. Just in case. I think that's why. All right. Now, there's another uh, thing about this illegitimacy thing. Every child. Every illegitimate child is born with the curse of rejection from the womb. Not only does it have the curse of the bastard on it, it also has the curse of rejection from the womb. Because when that mother finds out she's expecting, her first reaction is, oh no! That little one gets its first whack. Mama doesn't want it. When the father finds out, oh no, bang, you just did again. When their parents find out, oh, no, 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 no. That little thing is just the beginning to be in the mother's womb. And already it's got dreadful curses. It has a curse of illegitimacy on it. It has curses hanging on it of rejection from the father, from the mother, from the grandparents, from the aunts, the uncles. That's not fair, is it? I'm just letting this soak in on you. This is what the devil is doing to a nation. To tell you something else. To have those curses of rejection, a baby doesn't have to be illegitimate. In some marriages, there is so much strife between husband and wife that when mama finds out she's expecting, she says, Oh, good grief, now I've got to stay with this slug. That little one is born knowing that nobody wants it. It even happens in some cases where there's a mother or father who wants a boy and they get a girl or vice versa. Some of you sitting here have gone through that child to grow up realizing they didn't want me, they wanted a boy or they wanted a girl. 
what happened? You say you're just imagining things? I was talking about this over in Western Pennsylvania several months ago. And a registered nurse came up to me who for 15 years had worked in the, bed, in the nursery for the newborn babies. It was by choice. This is where she wanted to work. Christian woman. She came up to me with tears in her eyes and she said, Pastor Worley, everything you said about those babies is exactly true. She said, we who work in that nursery spend most of our time trying to comfort those little unwanted babies. She said, Brother Worley, it is the most pitiful thing. She said, they cry all the time. From the time they are born, they cry and cry and cry. Their little hearts are just broken, so they know nobody wants them. And said, we rock them and we try to show love to them because nobody wants those little fellas. And those little things know it. Said, I used to rock them and pray for them. Now I'm going to rock them and break curses. Isn't that great? What I'm simply saying, people, is it's serious what the devil is doing to the nation. You and I have authority to break these curses and start tearing them apart and destroying the foundation for the enemy. Praise the Lord. Isn't that good news? Yeah. There's another curse that God puts on people that is, goes to the fourth generation. God has said in his word, made it quite clear, there's only two sources of supernatural power and knowledge available. The legitimate source of supernatural power and knowledge is the Word of God, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the legitimate channel through which you and I should receive supernatural power and knowledge. All right? If you don't go that route, you can go through the illegitimate channel through the occult. And you will receive supernatural power and supernatural knowledge, but you will pay a dreadful price for it. Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The devil said, you will buy power and knowledge in my market, and you will pay and pay and pay and pay. Now, I know he doesn't advertise it that way. I'm just telling you how it really is. His advertisements read somewhat different from that. Expand your mind. Reach out into the universe. Send a call out into the universe. I guarantee you do something to answer. Find yourself. Well, yeah. Jesus has already found you. But you see, God said, if you reach out for that power and knowledge to other sources, that is spiritual adultery. If a man comes home from out, he comes into his wife and he says, Honey, I just went out and committed adultery. I didn't really mean that. I just thought I'd see how it was. That makes feelings about a gal? No, I see heads. Mm -mm. Well, of course not, because adultery is adultery, right? God says that reaching out the demon for knowledge, and that's what it amounts to, is spiritual adultery. He said, if you do that, I will curse you to the third and fourth generation. Every pulpit in the land ought to be thundering the warning about the curses of God, and you won't find hardly anybody saying a word. But it's changing. Thank God it's changing slowly. God's raising up a few Elijahs and Deborahs across the land, and they're trumping them out the salt. Cleaning house, urging people to get right, breaking curses. Thank God. Most encouraging sign I've seen in a long time. That means that when you played with that Ouija board, which is an ancient occult tool, you were cursed, the children were cursed, the grandchildren were cursed, your great-grandchildren were cursed. How's that? That means that when you dabbled with the astrology chart, you were cursed, the children were cursed, grandchildren were cursed, your great-grandchildren were cursed. That means that when you played with ESP, you were cursed, your children were cursed, your grandchildren were cursed, your great-grandchildren were cursed. That means that when you got hypnotized or tried it, you were cursed, your children were cursed, great, your grandchildren were cursed, your great-grandchildren were cursed. Are you getting the idea this is no game, it's not fun time? And you just thought it was a game. That's what the devil wanted you to believe. Sucker. Aren't we all? Unless Jesus shows us, we're all fools. We're taken in. Now let me mention some common things that are in your cult. I mentioned the Ouija board. Sorcery. You know what sorcery is, of course? Comes from the Greek word pharmakia, which means to contact the occult and open your mind to the occult, which is opening yourself to demons. So drugs. It's one of the quickest ways to get demons by the legion in you. If you just really want to have demons, 
I suggest you get some marijuana, a preferably LSD or speed. It'll do it faster. I mean, if you're longing to have legions of demons in you, that's one of the best ways I know to do it, because it'll drop every protection you've got. Bang! Instant insanity. Takes longer with some of the other things. Drugs are instant. You can go through alcohol, too. It takes a little while. You get DT, you know, that's when you've seen in the spirit world. And drugs, you can do it just bang like that. You can drop a bit of LSD and it won't be a little while, but the colors will all run together. And you'll be into the spirit world. And sorcery is nothing in the world but contacting the occult, the demon world, through drugs. It's an ancient occult device. There's nothing new about it. Listen, the devil could care less about the kids getting high. That's only the bait. The reason is to hook up with demons and fill them full. And boy, he's done a job, hasn't he? Because it's smart to have a little grass. It's really up to date to snort some cocaine, huh? When you do, you've thrown the gate open and said, with every demon in the vicinity that doesn't have a home, come on. We have an open house. And Jerry Clint said long ago, demons, the devil is no gentleman. The demons will come in on the slightest pretext, but must be kicked out in Jesus' name. They will not leave without being forced to leave. Now, witchcraft of any kind, white, gray, or black, it's all the same rotten mess. Automatic writing, handwriting analysis, fortune telling of any kind. That includes bumps on the head, palm reading, tea leaves, coffee grounds, whatever. Every bit of that is all in the realm or you're inviting the demons, please come and join into me because I don't have anything else to do. Well, they'll give you plenty to do before so. And then I've already mentioned hypnosis, EFT, levitation, or table tipping, and lifting people with your fingers in that cube. Never stop to figure out why it worked, did you? Oh, it worked. Oh, you bet. But a lot worse that you didn't see work. While you were watching the devil do the little trick, he was tricking you. And he moved in a whole slew on you. The demons of the occult, have, I've been traced them to everything, to, from marriage breaking to terminal illnesses. They cause every kind of mental, physical, and emotional destruction that you can name. We've, we've linked some occult spirits to some of these things. They are nasty birds. Now, let me mention a few more. There are some more. Clairvoyance. That's where you see all these dreadful things happening to everybody. Have you ever noticed that you, you think you catch more bad things than you do good on these things? You know, you're always seeing accidents and sickness. It's easier for the demons to arrange that. Besides, they hate to give you money and things like that. That's, you know, they can do it, but they don't like that. They'd rather do the horrible things. Too. Then you see them ahead and then you, you have a gift. Then yeah, you sure do. You can get rid of it, though. Thank God. This is the end of part A of this CD. Please play part B. Thank you.